All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, we're here tonight to pretty much talk about um, a debate that I had with um, Kent Hovind about a month ago on the Great Debate Community. Uh, we were discussing morality um, and the well, argument that I put forth um, is called Gnome. I'll link it in the description if you guys want to look at it. Um, it's a two part, at least at this point, it'll end up being at least a three part, maybe a five part by the time I get done with it. But it's only about six minutes long total. Um, both both videos together is only about six minutes long. Um, and during that debate, I, uh, Kent had brought up um, the Nazi party because, you know, that's all where it always goes with uh, <laughs> morality. Um, and I cautioned him against using that because, in my opinion, um, he had far more in common with Hitler and Hitler's policies um, than at least I do and most of the atheists that I know. Um, and um, Landon and Trey happened to be watching and they, of course, being Christians, took issue with that. Um, and I think more than anything, um, I cited uh, Martin Luther <clears throat> in some of his views. And that's, that's what at least Landon really wants to talk about. And I think Trey want to get back into the, in the gnome uh, discussion if we can. Uh, so that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Just kind of going to throw it out there and make it an open discussion type deal. Each one of us, or at least Landon will start presenting what he's got. Um, we'll come back and kind of talk, you know, back and forth more than anything. Also, on the phone with me tonight, you guys aren't going to be able to see him, but he'll pop up. It looks like I'll be talking. But Matthew Steele is finally making a, a comeback, hopefully, at least somewhat. Um, he's still got a bad connection internet-wise. So that's why he's got to join us uh, via speakerphone. Um, but he'll be chiming in quite a bit, I hope, as well. So with that said, um, Landon, if you want to kind of take it, and you guys can start, and we just let's run from there. All right. Thank you, Ned. And again, thank you for um, having the conversation, continued conversation with us. Of course, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to uh, check into this. And uh, I'm going to try to give as many footnotes as I possibly can just to help those of you that are really interested in this topic to be able to chase some of these things down. That way, you know where I'm kind of getting my data from. I, I do have a, a little bit of a personal interaction with this in the sense that I've had the wonderful privilege of being able uh, to attend both Holocaust museums, the one near Jerusalem and the one in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's where I picked up one of my books that I'll be sourcing tonight, Carla Pewey's book on the new religions and the Nazis. Uh, and one of my professors was Dr. Uwe Simonetto, who authored the book Fabricated Luther, which uh, he spends some time in that book addressing this very topic, the connection between uh, Martin Luther and the anti-Semitism of the National Socialist Party of the Nazi regime in Germany. And so uh, I just wanted to try to give a little bit of a deeper take that maybe Dr. Hovind didn't have the opportunity to flesh out or chase down. Um, and so I just want to give a, a little bit fuller information, again, for those that are interested. And uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, first of all, I mean, this is a, this is a very heavy topic in, in the sense that there's so many moving parts that need to be fleshed out. Uh, there is the issue of Martin Luther and the Lutheran Reformation that went on to become the Protestant Reformation of Germany and of Europe of the 16th century. That in and of itself is its own topic. There's the idea that what became developed as higher critical textual theory of the New Testament that was birthed out of Germany from Rudolf Bultmann, Martin Heidegger, Paul Till. This version of radical skepticism toward the text was birthed out of Germany in the 19th century that began to kind of fuel and feed into the roots of uh, the what would become more of a liberal version of Lutheranism expressed in Germany during that time period. Now, you still had the conservative confessional um, Lutheran representation, but very much prominent during that time period was this liberal strand of Lutheranism, which had begun to doubt Things, for example, as the miraculous, as the incarnation, that uh, this quest for the historical Jesus that Albert Schweitzer set out um, to resolve in his uh, seminal work in the early 20th century. This all birthed out of German higher criticism, that there's an historical Jesus, which is a separate figure from the second person of the Trinity represented through 2000 years of confessional church history. Those are two different characters. OK, and this is on German soil birthed out of that. And then you have the probably more prominent religious element in Germany under um, the regime of Hitler and what was 
again, bubbling up post-World War I, was what was called the German Faith Movement, which was a combination of old Germanic tribalism, which tapped into things like Wotan, which was basically the German version of Odin, and this more earthy uh, nature type of worship, which to define our terms, I would say that um, atheistically, one does not have to refute that. Um, take a contemporary movie as an example, and anybody who's seen the, uh, the outrun of these Marvel movies that's had the characters such as Thor, one can be an atheist and believe that something like Thor exists, to be quite honest. That's just a high-level celestial being, right? Um, according to uh, R.C. Sproul, you know, a definition of God must encompass certain attributes that are associated with God. And an inability or a reluctance to adhere to that definition, one is not a theist at that point. One is, by all intents and purposes, uh, at least an atheist. So if somebody uses the term God or gods, that does not necessarily denote um, the one God or a monotheism or a supreme being uh, in terms of what would be expressed in the Judeo-Christian faith. So I do want to illustrate those uh, definitional aspects of it. Now, with, with that in mind, going um, kind of back to the Reformation era, uh, a lot of times what's attributed to is Martin Luther's work in 1543 on the Jews and their lies. And what we have to understand is during that time period, um, there was a massive revolution going on known as the, what would become the Protestant Reformation. And there was a lot of peasant wars going on. There was a lot of violence, conflict that was going on in that area. And Martin Luther himself did not intend to separate from Rome. OK, this was a decision that was made by Rome after 1521 around the Diet of Worms, where um, it basically began to snowball at that point that if this was going to continue, that at birth in Germany it was going to have to be something different, that Rome was rejecting the challenges that was put forth initially in 1517 at the 95 Theses. So uh, Luther had wrote an earlier work in 1527 called Jesus Christ, the Jew. OK, so how would we be able to put these two things together? What are we talking about here? Well, Martin Luther is concerned as a pastor, primarily, secondarily as a religious leader of a new movement. So he's thinking of protecting the spiritual and mental well-being of his own people. So when he's writing about earlier, Jesus Christ, the Jew, there was a lot of hope for him that the Jewish people would come into saving faith. He saw confidence in the gospel that it would work. Now, almost a decade later, again, in the midst of violence, bloodshed, uh, Germany being tore upside down. And again, we can't underestimate the impact that Luther had. There was, to our best estimation, eight different versions of German that was spoken during that time. His translation of the New Testament literally codified the German language into a single dialect. So there was a lot of fragmentation. There was a lot of fight and conflict going on. And I can't overemphasize this enough. From Luther's religious vantage point, there is a massive difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish. OK, the difference is between a racial ethnic identity and the other is purely religious. And this is where all Christians would agree. Every Christian is anti anything, Jewish, Islam. Hindu, we repudiate and reject all other religious claims. So in that sense, yes, Luther was anti-Jewish, but he was never anti-Semitic. Now, when you look at his cautions and challenges, he was getting information from the peasants, whether or not it was true or not, this was the information that he was received. Now, there is understanding that a lot of the information he received wasn't entirely accurate, but from his perspective, because of the abuse of the usury laws, and because of his exposure uh, to the, um, certain aspects of the Talmud, he had an understanding that there was uh, an intrinsic deception that the Jews were trying to implement within that culture. And it, they were using the usury laws in order to keep the people oppressed. So that brought, you know, an old cranky Luther to write rather harshly, which, again, in that time period was kind of par for the course. That's just how people talk back then. Now, I'm not saying as a Christian, I condone that kind of language. And I think the Christian worldview would endorse the idea that your worldview ought to be able to elevate you above your surroundings to be able to speak truth to a particular culture. But during that time period, um, that's what he spoke. And I would say at that point, yeah, he was in error. He was in sin, but he was never anti-Semitic. There was nothing in his writings that attached anything 
to a genetic. He always held out hope that the Jewish people would come to the saving faith of Christianity. Now, let's fast forward into, do I think Adolf Hitler himself, if he cited um, Martin Luther on the Jews and their lies, that he had any understanding of that at all? And the answer is no. I don't think he had any understanding of Reformation Lutheran theology whatsoever. He had had a membership with the Catholic Church, which uh, any religious scholars know there's been a tension there from the beginning anyway. So if anything, he had an animosity toward Lutheranism as an ism. Uh, the version of Mein Kampf that I've looked up uh, at Barnes and Noble only mentioned Martin Luther one time, and it was in the same sentence with Richard Wagner. Now, if you know anything about those two characters, they have absolutely nothing in common except they're both from Germany. So the fact that he could put both of those people in the same sentence, that's the only time Martin Luther was ever mentioned, in the same sentence with Richard Wagner, then that should tell you that he's got one or both of those uh, miscalculated. And my, my money is on he got Martin Luther dead wrong. And I, I want to further substantiate this, given the fact of his affinity toward Nietzsche, which is a lot closer to atheism and certainly his affinity with social Darwinism or eugenics. Um, the idea of this racial purity, uh, this idea of trying to preserve the race was an understanding of evolution during that time period. I want to read the uh, famous line from Charles Darwin, 1871, in Descent to Man. We civilized men, on the hand, do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build systems for the imbecile, the maimed, and the sick. We institute poor laws, and our medical men exert their utmost skill to save the life of everyone to the last moment. This reason believe that vaccination has preserved thousands who, from a weak constitution, would formally have succumbed to smallpox. Thus the weak members of civilized society propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. Again, Charles Darwin, The Descent of Man, 1871. So the idea of preserving uh, a racial purity was not uh, contrary to Darwinism of that time period. Again, the full title of Darwin's book is uh, on the origin of species by means of natural selection and the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. The whole idea of preserving a favored race uh, in order to uh, have a stronger breed come out was very Darwinian in that implementation and understanding, especially during that time period by high level scientists. And I have several, uh, several lines of um, argumentation to sort of try to substantiate that. In this book by David Berlinski, um, he cites Richard Weichart, whose book Darwin to Hitler really chronicles that connection between Darwin to Hitler. He says here, um, Richard Weichart makes clear what anyone capable of reading the German source already knew. A sinister current of influence ran from Darwin's theory of evolution to Hitler's policy of extermination. A generation of German biologists had read Darwin and concluding that competition between species was reflected in human affairs by competition between races. Now, the reason we know this even further is, uh, for those of you that have Netflix, the BBC had put out a series of documentaries on genius, modern geniuses, and the one on Nietzsche actually illustrated this was what Nietzsche was angry at Darwin for, was talking about the preservation of a race. This was one of the contentions that he had. Now, that documentary goes on to try to separate uh, Nietzsche from anti-Semitism and what became fuel for the National Socialist Party. However, I, I would like to point your attention to uh, a recent book that came out just last year uh, entitled Nietzsche's Jewish Problem. And this came out in 2016 from Princeton Press uh, by Holub. And basically the contention of that whole book, again, that's Princeton Press. This is uh, academia that Nietzsche did have threads of anti-Semitism in him. And as Richard Wagner also had, there was a connection there and it, it's not as the, the TV show um, tried to separate. There actually is a stronger connection between those things. So it wasn't just propaganda from um, Nietzsche's sister and presenting Nietzsche's works to Hitler. Now, a, a further confirmation of this to show that there isn't as close of association with Lutheranism and Luther himself is, if you look at Nietzsche's work, um, The Will to Power, you know, on top of, um, you know, his, his earlier work, but the main one um, that, that's interesting is The Will to Power. Now, there was a Nazi propaganda movie called Triumph of the Will. And the reason I was reading that, I wanted to make sure I got those titles right. So you had Nietzsche's work, The Will to Power, that 
implemented the Ubermensch, which was accommodated and adopted by Hitler that was put in that movie, Triumph of the Will. Now, what stands contrary to both of those positions is Martin Luther's work called The Bondage of the Will. So here you have from that source the exact antithesis to what was being promoted by atheistic Nietzsche and what Hitler was using to galvanize his people and push them forward. Now, another interesting thing to, to kind of keep in mind is, again, this idea of the German faith movement. Um, and again, the German faith movement, as it was expressed back then, was very Germanic tribalism. OK, this is uh, even Anton LaVey, for example, in an interview said he could subscribe to Thor, Loki, Odin, uh, a lot of these expressions of thought because it's closer to nature. The whole thing about nature, natural order, this earthiness within nature, um, putting some kind of cosmic power. Look, somebody can be an atheist and believe in sacred geometry, alchemy, again, cosmic beings. It, the very second you implement multidimensional reality, You've just opened the door to who knows what kind of realities that could exist. So this isn't necessarily closer to theism or Christianity than it is away from atheism or even Darwinism. Like there's there's room in this discussion for a Darwinism that has a spiritual element to it. That's not closer to Christianity. Uh, it may not be nestled right next to atheism, but I would certainly say it's closer to atheism, given how contemporary atheism utilizes Darwinian evolution in order to have an explanatory worldview. Um, and again, this book was what was on sale at the um, Holocaust Museum. And so I just I just reference um, all your listeners uh, that want to dig into a little bit deeper. They can certainly check that source out. But uh, for the most part, by and large, the consensus is um, that the ideas that came about from eugenics was driven by a high society of learned scientists and what they were doing was simply implementing those scientific um, methods into practice. Now on the um, documentary, sorry about that, on the documentary Expelled by Ben Stein, he goes to the Hadamar Museum. Okay, this is in Germany and the very curator in the Hadamar Museum said point blank, the reason they were conducting the experiments and slaughtering those that were Mentally, uh, mentally retarded, those that they deemed unfit to continue to breed was based on Darwinism. So if somebody in that country curating the museum says that was the basis of what they were doing, then we ought to take that at the face value that that's exactly what was going on. So I think the connection from Hitler to Darwin and Darwinism is significantly closer than confessional Lutheranism, uh, even though he may have cherry picked a few verses out of one work by Luther, which I guarantee you he had no idea what the context was. That's why he imprisoned confessional Lutherans. That's why people such as Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others were in prison camps with the Jews because of their religious commitment. They didn't submit to uh, the German faith move movement. Excuse me. Uh, in this particular book here, The Third Reich in Power, they mention on page 501 that Hitler had commanded um, all of his higher officers to renounce their church memberships. Um, which was kind of an interesting fact. If he was so friendly with Christianity, why is he telling them to abandon um, their Christian beliefs? And in, in this particular book, the, the Hitler Youth, there's an interesting uh, parallel that they draw here. This nature versus nurture debate had, of course, been going on universally since Darwin. But in Germany, it had increasingly defined the medical zeitgeist as racist, a view held sway over all leading national socialists. And there's a footnote in the back to validate that in this particular book. Now, again, these aren't Christian scholars. These are just general academics kind of uh, giving uh, sort of the, the, the history of the matter of, of what took place. So I think it's kind of the, the minor view to say that National Socialism's actions associated with anti-Semitism and what took place in the Holocaust are closer to Lutheranism and more specifically Protestant Christianity than they are Darwinism or atheism. So that gives you something to kind of come back on that. All right. Sorry. I wasn't unmuted. Um, all right, man. Um, thanks. Uh, so basically what it, what we are looking at, um, I think the best way to kind of split it up is since I, in the other debate, 
I had spoke to a couple of things as far as what Luther and whatever, but I never got a chance to get into the Darwin end of it. Um, so what me and Matthew were thinking is, is Matthew will address the the Lutheran side of the, the argument that you made there. Then when he gets done, I'll just springboard into that and then go into the, um, the uh, evolution and Darwin type deal. Um, if that's cool with you guys. Okay. All right, uh, Matthew, you're up. Um, do me a favor, Landon. I can see you. If when I when Matthew starts talking, if he goes dead, just kind of wave at me so I can see that you don't hear him. But if you can hear him, just give me a thumbs up. All right, Matthew, you're good to go whenever you want to start. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. He he's good. All right. So I think that the simplest way to approach this is to just, rather than uh, addressing what scholars or museum curators or uh, historians have to say about Martin Luther, let's just go to what Martin Luther actually wrote himself. I think that's the easiest way. The only, the only concern that I have is differentiating uh, this opposition to Jews versus anti-Semitism. I don't see any way to separate a uh, the ethnic Jew from the religious culture. So I'll just I'll, I'll read. It's going to be chapter eleven of a book that was published three years before his death by Martin Luther. Um, this is one of three books that he wrote against Jews. And it's in 1940, or sorry, uh, 1543, called On the Jews and Their Lies, and this is chapter 11. What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? Since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct, now that we are aware of their lying and reviling and blaspheming. If we do, we become sharers in their lies, cursing and blasphemy. Thus we cannot distinguish the unquenchable fire of divine wrath of which the prophets speak, nor can we convert the Jews. We, with prayer and the fear of God, we must practice a sharp mercy to see whether we might save at least a few from the glowing flames. We dare not avenge ourselves. Vengeance a thousand times worse than we could wish them already had them by the throat. I shall give you my sincere advice. First, to set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn, so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christian Christendom, so that God might see that we are Christians and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, and blaspheming of his son and of his Christians. For whatever we tolerated in the past unknowingly, and I myself was unaware of it, will be pardoned by God. But if we, now that we are informed, were to protect and shield such a house for the Jews, existing right before our very nose, in which they lie about, blaspheme, curse, vilify, and defame Christ and us, as was heard above, it would be the same as if we were doing all of this, and even worse, ourselves, as we very well know. In Deuteronomy 13.12, Moses writes that any city that is given to idolatry shall be totally destroyed by fire and nothing of it shall be preserved. If he were alive today, he would be the first to set fire to the synagogues and houses of the Jews. For in Deuteronomy 4.12 and 12.32, he commanded very explicitly that nothing is to be added to or subtracted from his law. And Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15.23, that disobedience to God is idolatry. Now the Jews' doctrine at present is nothing but the additions of the rabbis and the idolatry of disobedience, so that Moses has become entirely unknown among them, as we said before, just as the Bible became unknown under the papacy in our day. So also, for Moses' sake, their schools cannot be tolerated. They defame him just as much as they do us. It is not necessary that they have their own free churches for such idolatry. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed, for they pursue in them the same aims as in their synagogues. 
Instead, they might be lodged under a roof or in a barn like the gypsies. This will bring home to them the fact that they are not masters in our country as they boast, but that they are living in exile and captivity as they incessantly wail and lament about us before God. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught be taken from them. Fourth, I advise that their rabbi, rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. For they have justly forfeited the right to such an office by holding the poor Jews captive and with the saying of Moses in Deuteronomy 17.10, in which he commands them to obey their teachers on penalty of death. Although Moses clearly adds, what they teach you in accord with the law of the Lord. Those villains ignore that. They wantonly employ, they wantonly employ the poor people's obedience contrary to the law of the Lord and infuse them with this poison, cursing, and blasphemy. In the same way, the Pope also held us captive with the declaration in Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter, etc., inducing us to believe all the lies and deceptions that issued from his devilish mind. He did not teach in accord with the word of God, and therefore he forfeited the right to teach. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews, for they have no business in the countryside, since they are not lords, officials, tradesmen, or the like. Let them stay at home. I've heard it said that, the, that a rich Jew is now traveling across the country with 12 horses. His ambition is to become a Kokba, Kokba devouring princes, princes, lords, lands, and people with his usury, so that the great lords view it with jealous eyes. If you great lords and princes will not forbid such usurers to highway legally, someday a troop may gather against them, having learned from the true nature of the Jews and how one should deal with them and not protect their activities. For you, too, must not and cannot protect them. You wish to become participants in, an, in their abomination in the sight of the Lord. Consider carefully what good could come of this and prevent it. Six, I advise that usury be prohibited to them, and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them and put aside for safekeeping. The reason for such a measure is that as said above, they have no other means of earning a livelihood than usury, and by it they have stolen and robbed from us. Such money should now be used in no other way than the following. Whenever a Jew is sincerely converted, he should be handed 100, 200, or 300 florins, as personal circumstances may suggest. With this, he could set himself up in some occupation for the support of his poor wife and children, and the main maintenance of the old or feeble. For such evil gains are cursed that they are not put to use with God's blessing in a good and worthy cause. But they, when they boast that Moses allowed or commanded them to exact usury from strangers, citing Deuteronomy 23.20, apart from they cannot adduce as much as a letter in their support. We must tell them that they are, there are two classes of Jews or Israelites. The first comprises those whom Moses, in compliance with God's command, led from Egypt and into the land of Canaan. To them he issued his law, which they were to keep in that country and not bomb beyond it, and then only until the advent of the Messiah. The other Jews are those of the emperor and not of Moses. These days... Uh, back to the, the time of Pilate, the procurator of the land of Judah. For when the latter asked them before the judgment seat, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, crucify him, crucify him. He said to them, shall I crucify your king? They shouted in reply, we have no king but Caesar. God had not commanded of them such submission to the emperor. They gave it voluntarily. But when the emperor demanded the obedience to him, they resisted and rebelled against him. Now they, are, they no longer wanted to be his subjects. Then he came and visited his subjects, gathered them in Jerusalem, and then scattered them throughout his entire empire so that they were forced to obey him. I'm going to go on to the, um, the seventh point because this is taking a long time here. Uh, the seventh and last point. I recommend putting a flail or axe or a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle into the hands of young, strong Jews and Jewesses and let, letting them earn their bread in the sweat of their brow as was imposed on the children of Adam in Genesis 3.19. For it is not fitting that they should let us accursed goyim toil in the sweat of our faces while they, the holy people, idle away their time behind the stove, feasting and farting. And on top of it all, on top of all, 
boasting blasphemously of their lordship over the Christians by means of our sweat. No, one should toss out those lazy rogues by the seat of their pants. Okay. Um, did you want to come... There. Yeah, and did did you want to come back on any of that, or did you just want to let that let I mean let that and and I'm talking to Matthew. Sorry, I should have said that. Um, was there anything you want to add? You know, as far as anything that Landon, you know, had said before we get in the back and forth. Um, and I guess I'm going to ask Landon in a second if he wants me to if we want to stop there and kind of dissect this. Um, but anyway, I want you to finish first, Matthew. Was there anything else you wanted to do? I, very very quickly, I want to um, point out that we are not trying to establish a causality between what Luther said and what Hitler did. We are rather showing the similarity in their hatred of the Jews. Now, you can argue that that is just a matter of religion versus ethnicity, but I think that that's a semantic issue that when Martin Luther is arguing that their synagogues and their homes be destroyed, and um, all of this is, is to have an effect on their state of mind, he's attacking the people. Regardless of the reason, he is attacking a group of people and advocate, <clears throat> excuse me, advocating all of these um, suggestions of how to handle those people in exactly the same way that Hitler said about um, putting Jews in, um, in ghettos and taking away their their um, their livelihood their um their riches and forcing them into this um sort of outcast second class citizen status in uh germany that was the aside from what was done in the concentration camps and in, in all honesty, there's there's a, a, a point later on in this very chapter where uh, Martin Luther argues that no um, no violence should be done against the Jews themselves. He's still advocating that their livelihood, what they own, where they live, where they worship, all of that be destroyed. So in that way, he does disagree with what Hitler did, apparently, but it is unavoidable. You, you cannot argue against what he's saying here. This isn't cherry picking. I read most of the chapter. Chapter 11, On the Jews and Their Lies, what he's Sincere, as he said, I shall give you my sincere advice on what he thinks should be done to the Jews. That's all there really is to say. And just so, just for the audience, um, there is an audio version of um, that book. Um, I'll make sure that that's linked in the in the description as well. Um, so if you want to listen to the entire book, um, that's there. And Landon, any audio books that you're that you know of that are citing there that you can you know you want to you want to provide me, I'll definitely link those as well. Um, so I guess the question from uh, your perspective, Landon, did you want to stop there and kind of dis dissect that and kind of do it back and forth there? Or do you want me to, to go into the um, oh, Darwinian side of this? Because I mean, there, I, it seems like there's a lot to chew on here. So. Yeah, just real quick. I pretty much addressed everything Matthew just said. It's uh, ironic. Matthew never quoted Luther's work on Jesus Christ, born a Jew. Um, that he is cherry picking just one book of one section and that there is a radical difference between Ju Judaism as a religion and ethnic connection. Um, ask any contemporary Messianic Jew. They will tell you there is a radical difference between the two. And the fact that, again, uh, Luther never said anything harm to the individual shows that radical difference, which obviously Hitler did not do. And again, 
Luther is thinking as a pastor protecting his people from the corrosive damages of false religious views. Um, was it an oversight? Was a lot of that hyperbole? Well, certainly it was. Um, and so, again, I addressed a lot of that stuff earlier. I can draw a tighter connection, uh, in particular, this biography um, on Hitler, uh, to kind of make this point a, a little bit closer. You know, quote, uh, what's missing from Mein Kampf, and this is a fact which has not received the acknowledgement it should, is any emphasis on Christianity. Um, and again, that kind of is a running theme. I kind of immerse myself in all this Hitler stuff over and over again. Uh, if time would permit, I could just unload the amount of quotes of his complete hatred of Christianity. Uh, along with Nietzsche, that these guys despised Christianity because they felt it propagated the weak. They felt that its, it's message of compassion, its message of contrition, brokenness, these are all things that they completely repudiated and despised. Their hatred of Christianity is well known and well established. This aspect of Luther that, that Matthew read, you know, I already addressed all that. There's a contextual element to it. Uh, you have but to understand it, the history of it. And again, you would have to read his earlier work on Jesus Christ, born the Jew, and draw that parallel and think, okay, what's going on? What, what do you know about the peasant wars during that time period? Right, okay. well, you know about the cultural climate. There was a lot of things that, that feed into that. You can't, I'm saying no, you can't just cherry pick words and say, haha, this is what it means in our 20th century vernacular. The culture does matter on that. Just, let, just so so I'm clear, Landon, when you're, I mean, when I'm hearing and the, I'm, not, I'm not trying to enforce this on you, if this is not what you're saying, um, but what I'm hearing is, is that he is basically Luther is basically using the word Jew as a placeholder for pretty much anybody that's not Christian at that point. Would that be accurate in what you're saying? No, he's speaking to the Jewish people religiously. If they're ethnically a Jew, then that's just uh, an aspect of their religious expression. Right, that's but, what he means by Jew is religiously, which is why he says doesn't, don't harm them. Yeah, that, that's that's what I'm talking about. Is that, in in short, um, you know, anyone who is religiously um, non, I guess, um, you know, isn't like minded to to Luther, this could apply to is is what I'm hearing. Your your no saying. no no, Ned. It is specific to those practicing Judaism in Germany during that time period who were uh, abusing the usury laws and things of that nature. Again, this is information that he was fed. Again, he's thinking as a pastor of protection, so on. Again, all that stuff I've already said. No, he is thinking of religious Judaism in Germany in the 16th century, specifically. All right, and I mean, again... Well, can I ask one question? Yeah, go um, let, me, let me just ask you one question. Um, the second suggestion, the second uh, piece of advice that um, Martin Luther gave in his own words, says, I advise that their houses also be raised and destroyed. Now, what? how do you square uh, what he's suggesting in terms of ethnicity versus religion when you have um, children who are innocents losing their homes and being cast into barns or, or, or whatever it, is, it goes on to say? Um, that, that isn't, does not seem to be uh, a suggestion that is specifically for a religion that has to do with where people sleep, where they're where they're they, they play with their children and and give birth to their babies and eat their dinner. Okay, you don't you don't have to bring in the, the children thing for for sentiment's sake. The idea was again, it was the abuses of the usury laws and the fact that these Jewish religious practitioners were enslaving the peasants because of that. So this was a bit of um, an understanding of because this has been done to you, don't even go into those homes because they're so corrupted. Just burn them down um, as, you know, again, this is this is all in religious context. If you remove the religious context from it, then you're missing the whole thing. All right. I mean, all right. Again, I guess the question, do we want to stay here and start to dissect this more or do you guys want me to get me to go into the Darwin side. You might as well go on to the Darwin and let us. Matthew wants to do a final point. I don't. I don't feel there's anything else I need to say that I didn't. Well, say I mean, I mean, I I definitely think that we need to to have conversation back and forth because some of the things that you're saying, I definitely want to.
to talk about. But what I'm saying is, is I don't want to to quell this and just make it about just Luther. If you want to, if you want me to give you my take on the um, Darwin side, because I don't want to. That, that's what I'm saying is if we start getting into this, since we've only we got a very, I don't say short time, but we've got limited time. How do you want to go from there? Uh, go ahead and jump into Darwin, and then you can bring in Trey, and then you can just springboard from Darwin into the whole moral thing. Um, and that that way I can just completely get out of the way. Trey can come in and take it from here. Okay. All right. So uh, I don't really have anything to add anyway. I, I think I've said all that needs to be said. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, or did Trey want to go first? I, I didn't even think about that. Trey, did did you want to go first, or did you want me to go into the Darwin and then the um, and then the um, no, you know, it's like, fine. It's it's cohesive. Uh, uh, you know, a representation of social Darwinism is uh, is pretty relevant to uh, uh, to the to the Nazi perspective. So I think that uh, that you know, giving an opportunity for you to say it's probably pretty fair. Okay. All right. So what I'll do, what my plan is anyway, if I don't get sidetracked, is I'll try to address um, some of the some of the Hitler um, Darwin um, claims to marry things, um, and then um, I'll stop there. See if you want to. If anybody wants to discuss a little bit of that, and then I guess go back into Gnome real quick, um, and then you can come back on Gnome, and we can, and then we can go. I guess just wherever we want to go from there. Does that that sound right? That how everybody want to go? Sure, okay. that sounds perfect. All right. So, um, as far as Hitler and um, Darwin, um, again, I'm I'm going to look at what Hitler did, um, and in my opinion, you know, I mean, there's a lot of when you're looking at the, the literature that's out there, um, a lot of people want to marry it, um, you know, kind of like Landon did earlier in that, you know, it's saying that oh, what Darwin was writing about um, what happens with the smallpox and all of this other thing. Again, the claim that I made with um, Kent was that my beliefs don't run as close to Hitler as his did. Now, I'll, I'll go ahead and champion Darwin, Darwin here, or at least somewhat do it. Um, but my my views are a lot closer to, well, they're not a lot, a lot closer. They mirror um, the, I guess, um, more evolved evolutionary <laughs> theory, for lack of a better term. So some of the things that, that Darwin said, we know that if he would have had the understanding that we have now, more than likely, he probably wouldn't have said because they do not reflect what what modern evolution teaches. Um, namely, that quote that um, that uh, Landon gave about um, you know the, the weaker people dying off, and and if we save the um, people that are dying from smallpox, we're weakening the species. That's absolutely contrary to what. Um, evolution teaches us, at least modern evolution. So anyhow, but I want to get back into exactly what Hitler, as far as what his writings, what everything that he did, how he felt about Darwin. Um, because as much as Landon is showing us or trying to portray that Hitler absolutely hated um, Christianity, apparently he wasn't very fond of, um, <laughs> of uh, Darwin in particular. Um, if you look at, if you look through Mein Kampf or you read Mein Kampf, which I, I suggest everyone do, it's a, it's an interesting read because it starts off and you're almost scared because you're thinking, damn, a lot of these points make sense. Now, by the end of it, it changes a little bit, <laughs> more than a little bit, whatever. But anyway, the interesting thing that I found in there is, is that number one, there was only one scientist that Hitler even remotely, um, talked about. And the guy that he did, you know, that he actually referenced, um, what happened to be an American. Um, and I'm making sure that I don't misquote his name. I know his last name is Chamberlain, but I wanted to make sure I got the full thing. Um, his, his name was Stuart, I'm sorry, Houston Stuart Chamberlain. Now Chamberlain lived from 1855 to 1927. He is completely contrary to everything that Darwin writes. And if you look, so from the scientific perspective, as far as what Hitler wanted to say, he would mirror um, what, um, God, I'm losing my mind, what 
Chamberlain once said. Um, there's also another guy in there that was author um, Kamati Doug Gaba Yu, and I know I screwed that up. Sorry, everyone. Um, they ran basically the biggest anti-Darwin um, oh, science uh, available at the time. They in no way, shape, or form supported what Darwin was said, um, and they looked at it as pretty much like most creationists do today, as it's ridiculous and it couldn't be true. So when we have only one scientist in the entire Mein Kampf ever, and it's not Darwin, in fact, it runs contrary to Darwin, that would have a tendency to run the opposite direction. Chamberlain was also a devout Christian. So was Gavin Yu. Um, then you go back up and you start reading, you know, who, who were the other people that were, you know, extremely influential in Hitler's life. And you run into Christian after Christian after Christian. Now, is that surprising? No, because everybody back in those days were Christians. Um, you look, you know, there, Karl Luger was one of his, he, he was an Austrian politician and Hitler specifically said he was the greatest, um, German of all times. Um, the other guy that I'm drawing a blank on right now, um, oh God, I'm losing my mind. I'm trying to go through my notes, but anyway, um, so when you start in, uh, now I just remembered it and I remember where it was, um, the composer, um, Oh God, what is his name? I this is cool. Richard Wagner. There you go, Wagner. Same thing on Wagner. Um, you know, look at look at Wagner and you know what what he did and, and who, you know, what was his influences on and those stuff, how much of an anti-Semite Wagner was. And all of these guys, for the most part, are you know running along the same type of views is where is what Hitler was doing. Um, now, the most telling part about this is, is what Hitler's views on humanity were specifically. Hitler was a creationist. End of discussion. There's no debate on this. What Hitler was trying to do through his breeding policy, if you will, runs absolutely contrary to evolutionary theory in that he was trying to isolate a group of humans. Why? Because he thought those humans were, quote unquote, pure and the closest in every possible um, oh, expression of humanity, namely the Aryan. The Aryan race, in his opinion, was divinely created as the apex human. Any breeding of an Aryan with any other, quote unquote, species, which again, that's a ridiculous term when it comes to humans, um, would muddy the water, would would take away from um, the intellect, the, the strength, the power of the Aryan. All it could do is the, the offspring would be worse. Darwinian, even Darwinian evolution back in those days was not, and especially nowadays, was not looking at separating species for purity. Even if you look at the, I mean, I know what the um, subtext or the sub, um, header on Darwin, Dar Darwin's book is The Preservation of Species. Again, read the book, because once you understand that that verbiage is not indicative of what the theory says, and especially modern day um, evolution, modern day evolution is, in the simplest terms, the larger the genetic pool that we have, the better the species chance of su survival is regardless what that species is. If I draw out a subset of any species, by definition, that species has less of a chance to propagate and guard against future events, either uh, anything from disease, through climate change, through an, an asteroid hitting the planet. If we believed that, if that, if that's what science taught now, well, there would be people like, oh, um, Stephen Hawking. He, he should have been killed or done away with years ago and definitely not allowed to prop, um, you know, procreate. But again, we see that even people that are that, um, from a physical standpoint, that constrained in their abilities can not only uh, benefit the species, but benefit the species, <laughs> in my opinion, at least exponentially um, greater impact than 
you know, us normal people like myself. I mean, I will never have that type of reach. I'll have, I'll never come up with the things that he did. And hopefully I'll never end up being as, um, oh, physically disabled as he is. But again, the claim that was made during the um, Kent Hovind debate was my beliefs run a lot, run, run far different than Hitler compared to Mr. Hovind's. So when we look at this and we look at, again, I understand why Landon and, you know, everybody else is having a problem with Luther because yes, Luther is kind of the key figure when it comes to their sect of Christianity. But it's tough to get away from, you've got a creationist, you've got someone who at least pur purports to be a, a, um, a Christian, you have someone who follows somewhat to the letter what Luther prescribed. Um, you have a guy who believes in God and everything that he did. And I, I just want to touch on this. I, I want to do this in the back and forth, but redefining atheism to mean that you can believe in a God, but you're still an atheist does not reflect me, does not reflect the claim that I made. So to try to prescribe that because Hitler now believes in Thor, believes in these other gods, which I think would be hard to hard to de demonstrate anyway. But if he believes in any god, the problem I understand, Landon, show me that all day. That the key is on that though. We are not talking about what Hitler wrote. We are not talking about what Mein Kampf says. We're not talking but that's about what, but that's what's in there, Ned. And that's why I've got this at the Holocaust Museum, brother. Yes. Again, and I can sit here and I can quote probably for longer than um, um, Matthew did Mein Kampf on this and go through line after line after line of what Hitler said in Mein Kampf, what he said in. Um, speeches about Christianity, um, you know, on and on and on. Well, that's now, what I was saying, buddy. like right here in the biography, it talks about his hatred of Christianity. So what, what speeches are you cherry picking that only show the propaganda that he was administering? Okay. You have to know. Wait, 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 a yeah. second. wait a second, Landon. So you're going to, I mean, here's the thing. You're playing both sides of the fence. So on one hand, when he's talking about Christianity, Christianity is pure propaganda. But when he's talking about atheism, because he specifically said in one in one um, one speech to do away with the atheist, of course, that's propaganda as well. But at the same time, whenever he says something that you, I guess, would want to attribute to him, that can't be propaganda. No, no, no. He was he was being truthful there. So that that's, I guess, can, problem can I make the distinction. I might actually be able to help on this one. Um, the the distinction most often made is that obviously Hitler was a political figure. A lot of his speeches were designed to be disingenuous, just like most politicians. He's a liar. I mean, that's what they do to cultivate their power initially. That's my, um, that is exactly my point, Trey. So if he's a liar, why are you using part. his own biography? Right, but there's a second part. Christians. You what can't about play both sides of the fence. Yes, no, no, what I'm saying is there are more reliable sources than his speeches, like his private letters with his SS officials would be something that would be a better reference than some other ones. So that's why, you know, some of the contextualization really does make a difference. I agree 100%. And what I'm saying is, is in order, number one, just because he is writing a letter to a an official, which in my opinion would make it even worse, especially when you're talking about SS, he is trying, I mean, we all agree that Hitler was trying to do one thing and one thing only. He was trying to control the masses as much as possible, which by definition is anti-science. I mean, and I, I want to get off on that rabbit hole, but I want to stay with this for a second. When you're starting to look at, he's writing letters to his quote unquote trusted advisors and they reflect, let's say what he wrote in a biography and they reflect this, somehow you have to be able to go in there and say, okay, when he was writing to this official, he was being completely honest. When he was writing to this official or giving a public speech or writing Mein Kampf, which at that point, he was a nobody. He was in a prison cell. All of that was contrived. All of that, everything in Mein Kampf was doing nothing except just trying to, oh, 
you know, he knew later on somehow that he was going to be in power. And now this book, you know, would be referenced. So he was lying in that as well. And that's what I'm saying. You can't play both sides of the fence here. Now, let's I want to get back into in the into the Darwin end of it and scientific methodology, because hey, yeah, just one second. Yeah. I need to remind you of a point that we discussed earlier. Uh, go ahead. The, I, uh, equivocation of creationism and Christianity and evolution and atheism. Yeah. And that, that's thanks, Matthew. That, that's kind of where I was going. Um, so what what I'm looking at here is, is when we start to look at atheism and um, evolution, number one, you can be an atheist and not be not believe in evolution by any means, any any stretch of the imagination. I, I can ref reference you a couple of people um, online if you'd like to talk to them. However, if again, we're talking about my claims, I reflect I don't reflect Hitler's beliefs nearly as much as Mr. Hoban does. So let's go back to what a couple of a couple of things that were said earlier. If we look at what Mar if we look at what Martin Luther was saying about restricting their schools, restricting the books, covering up everything so no one will ever be able to reference their material again. Hitler did the exact same thing. He had a book list that was banned. Interestingly, most, if not all, of Darwin's writings were on that banned list. Secondarily, if you are using scientific methodology, there is no person that is not beyond reproach. In other words, I'll just quote my favorite physicist of all time, Richard Feynman. I don't care who you are. I don't care what letters you have behind your name. I don't care what you've done. And I damn sure don't, know, don't care who you represent. If you are wrong, you are wrong. That, in essence, is scientific methodology. Now, we walk in and we say that to Hitler. We're going to be shot in the head in a, in a heartbeat. There, I mean, especially if, you know, if he's got anything to say about it whatsoever, he will kill us instantly. Maybe Christianity, maybe religion doesn't go to that extreme, but it definitely says you are not to, to question the omni-god, the apex of leadership. The same way that Hitler was at the apex of leadership in the Nazi regime, God is at the apex of leadership in most religions, Christianity specifically. That runs a lot closer to Hitler than it does me. I can question anybody, including God. I don't, there is nothing that quote unquote is banned from my reading list, including the Bible or any other type of scripture. Take it apart, read it question it. If I'm wrong as a, as a, um, atheist, as you know, I want to see that. I want to um, look at that. That is not indicative of a totalitarian dictator or theocratic government in any way, shape or form. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It is exactly what we see. I hate to put it this way, but in scripture, you do not question God. I mean, if you think, if you think you can question God, go talk to Job. Go look at what happened when when Job, after being tortured, I would say had a fairly uh, benign question. And what does God do instead of answer his question? All he does is say, "Who are you to who are you to question me?" Which is exactly what Hitler would have said if I would have walked up to him and said, "Why are you killing these Jews? What 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 are you thinking?" If he would have let me finish that sentence, it would have been, "Who the hell do you think you are that you can question me? I am." Um, you know, I am the leader. I am the man. So again, if we look at methodology, if we look at approach to information, I'm not trying to be combative. I'm just saying my methodology is nowhere reflective as to Hitler, whereas I'm sorry, but Mr. Hovens absolutely reflects it both in methodology and the people who Hitler looked at as their, as his, um, you know, whatever. Trey, sorry, go ahead. I know I talked over a lot. No, that's fine, Ned. You did a great job. So, you know, uh, like I said, as you're pointing out, there there are some uh, uh, distinctions to be to be made uh, uh, between, you know, perspective worldviews. In, in this particular one's case. Um, 
you know, the, uh, the, the objective leadership is what you were perceiving as, uh, 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 as the correlation, but the key characteristic, uh, both with creationists and with all of Christianity is uh, a theology called the Imago Dei. It's the image of God. In fact, it's intrinsic to all humans. It's why life is sacred to us. It's why social Darwinism and eugenics is abhorrent to us. We don't want to kill babies. We don't want to kill people based on race or anything of that nature. We believe that they're all uniquely created in God's image. Um, the guy who wrote, uh, 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 he's a famous author uh, and historian. Um, his name's Charles Patterson. I've got a quote from him because I think that you might enjoy it. It's actually on Dr. Joseph Mengele. He said, Dr. Joseph Mengele, who conducted experiments on Jews and gypsies at Auschwitz, he had two doctorates, in case you're curious, would have fit in quite nicely in Colombia. To paraphrase Theodore Odono, the German Jewish philosopher who fled Nazi Germany, Auschwitz begins wherever somebody looks at a Colombian lab and thinks they're only animals. You see, that is one significant comparison between the people who are running the internment camps and murdering the Jews and the Christian worldview. And that's why obviously no Christians would have been able to be a member of the, uh, the staffing who did that is if you believe there's an intrinsic value and worth to humans because it's been bestowed upon them as a right by God, you can't experiment on them like they're animals and then murder them. It is something that you have to be from a materialistic or naturalistic perspective. That's not to say, you know, atheism, but you, like I said, these guys were distinctly materialists and naturalists. So that should give you, like I said, a, a correlation because I know that you, you do share, if you have the evolutionary perspective, you do perceive us as to be just animals. Um, there is no imago die. There is no soul or spirit per se, or at least it would be very hard to uh, indiscriminately describe such a thing from an atheistic perspective. Um, additionally, one of uh, uh, one of the most famous uh, people from the Nuremberg trials after World War had ended was Hermann Goring. He was a Reich Marshal, a five-star general in charge of the Air Force. Um, to give you an idea. He was very affluent and very well beloved. Even after World War, he was a popular person. Uh, after the war and all the atrocities that he had been committed, he was still very popular. And when he came on trial, he actually had to answer for his crimes. His response was, "Naturally, the common people don't want war. So obviously, you know, everybody's not exactly wanting a fight. But after all, it is simply the leaders of a country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter." to drag people along, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. He, of course, made those distinctions because, well, all of those forms of government were the ones who had come to put him on trial. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of their leaders. This is easy. All you have to tell them is that they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for a lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger, it works the same in every country. Now, from his worldview, and perceivably in Germany, he was 100% correct. That is what happened in his country. Um, doesn't matter what type of government he had in place, their perceivable worldview and their way of creating their government allowed for this to happen. And when he was placed on trial, they appealed to a concept that, you know, you have other countries who would have to exert specific unalienable rights, sovereign rights over other ones, and that he had broken these sacred rights. Well, they had to be objective, you know, above even the sovereignty of a nation or a sovereignty of a social culture. You know, to him, he had done nothing wrong. He had literally obeyed his rules. He had, uh, uh, he had been an excellent mili military leader. You know, this guy didn't perceive himself to be objectionable. So the, the principle, whereas, you know, yes, Christians, you know, we, we hold to an objective leadership and 
Adolf Hitler wanted to be God, so obviously he wanted to be an objective leadership in and of himself. You know, you're not wrong in pointing out that distinction. We do bow to a God, we just don't bow to Adolf Hitler. Um, and we would point out the fact that obviously we view a special image and unique nature to humanity that is not perceivable in an atheist or even in Adolf Hitler's worldview. Um, part of why it matters, however, is how we distinguish and determine truths. Like, you know, what methodology you go into it. We look at logical consistency, empirical adequacy, experiential relevance. And so these three values, uh, they're most popularized probably by Ravi Zacharias, um, are how we break down consistencies in our worldviews. We want to know, you know, does, does what we perceive and what we believe signify a value that can be objective and be used by other people? So as to the questions of empirical adequacy, I would point out that, you know, for the most obvious example, you know, Adolf Hitler, the reason he is a, a reference to begin with is because of the desire for looking for empirical adequacy. If, you're about, uh, if you share certain characteristics with Hitler, if you believe that humans are just animals or if they're just material beings, then, you know, you really have these questions that you have to ask. How did he go from that? Is it logically consistent that his worldview should uh, end with eugenics and the expression of, you know, uh, uh, mass murder and the like? So as to the question of, uh, uh, as to the question of, you know, the experience of evil, you know, it, it, evil's logical adequacy and the like, you know, we'll go with, uh, uh, we'll go with a, a more, a more concise, uh, a more concise perspective, I should say. I've got a, uh, I've got a fun quote for you. You might, uh, uh, you might enjoy it. It's from St. Augustine. So, you know, fourth century. He posed that for were it not good that evil things should exist, the omnipotent God would almost certainly not allow evil to be. Since beyond doubt, it is just as easy for him to not allow what is uh, what he does not will as it is for him to uh, allow what he will. Um, there's a unique and uh, beautiful theology that goes into the worldview that this is so distinctly different from what we've talked about even to the day. Um, if anybody's interested, uh, there are catechisms and uh, uh, confessions that are available. Um, it gives a really you know, beautiful perspective. Uh, if you're looking for uh, morality and the sovereignty of God, I recommend the Westminster uh, uh, Larger Catechism. Article 4 deals with pretty much everything from God's providence to uh, man's responsibility and the nature of evil in existence. Um, I encourage everybody to check that out. Uh, it would probably benefit everybody to uh, have a little bit more perspective on it. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy. All right. All thanks. Right, thanks um, uh, Landon. I, I got to add an echo for a second. Um, I guess um, Trey hit on a bunch of um, kind of the oh, things that gnome, um, I, I would say highlights are, in my opinion, at least, problematic. Um, did you want to go down that road? I mean, we only got 10 minutes, so it's going to be, I guess, I mean. If you just want to respond to his general statement there, Ned, take the last nine minutes to kind of respond to what Trey just said, and then close this out, buddy. You got the last nine minutes. All right. Um, I mean, God, there's, <laughs> okay, so I guess let's do Gnome in a nutshell. Gnome basically says this, that, with an omni god, everything is good. There is no such thing as evil. So, with that last quote that Trey put, it's completely irrelevant because he's right. Everything is good. It has to be. And anything that we perceive to be evil has to be the greatest of all goods, regardless of how we think it affects us personally. In short, a child getting a shot is going to think the doctor is evil, but that that doctor is doing what he can to save that child's life, potentially, depending on what the, you know, what the circumstances are. The child's not going to understand it. So when we see pain and suffering and people dying all over the world and whatever, and Hitler, 
well, we look at it as this isn't a good thing. It can't be. Well, we don't have God's perspective. So that's where Gnome starts is that we grant God is good. God is omni, which means he can do nothing but the greatest of all goods. And if he has got a goal, which I'm assuming you guys prescribe to because I, I haven't run into many people that don't as far as from the Christian, i.e. his will, his plan, that plan being omni has to come to fruition. There is no way around it. So all of that begets good. Um, he talked about, um, you know, prescribing value to the human and that we as atheists don't. No, we're the exact opposite. The, the value in a human being is intrinsic in that human being and us being part of that same race, i.e. team. We're going to, in the same way that if I was playing on, a, on one team and you guys were playing on a different team, I'm going to win or I'm going to want to win. And winning is good for me, but it's bad for you and vice versa. Now, if I change to your team, guess what? My goals have changed. And now you guys winning is good because I'm part of that team. That is what, that's where our, our value lay. With a God, human, especially the um, cannon fodder that go into hell, have little to no meaning, especially if all of this is to bring everything to fruition and allow his plan to be done. His will is what matters, not humanity. And I'm sorry, but I think the Bible is pretty clear on that, is that God is the ultimate as far as meaning and what matters. Um, as far as, um, you know, the God doesn't kill babies. God, or, or, or Christi Christians aren't taught to kill babies. Well, until God tells them to. Until a species of man is wicked and bad enough that they need to be completely eradicated. I mean, God did that himself to the entire planet, save eight. He did it. He prescribed it to Amalekites. And I mean, I don't have to go through the list. Everybody knows he specifically came down and killed David's child before it arguably took 10 breaths. God kills babies all the time. God prescribes the, the killing of babies in the same way that the people who went and fought for God through the Crusades and every, uh, every place else across here were following God's lead because that's God's commandment and what they felt is what God was mandating they do. And apparently it was because you can't thwart God's will and therefore God wanted that done. Hitler did the exact same thing. And the people that followed him the supreme leader told them these set of human beings are less than you. They're not worthy of you. They're bad. Kill them all. Eradicate them. So, yeah, eugenics, genocide. Sorry, that runs exactly what the Bible tells us. I mean, either and. I mean, mass torture, mass whatever. That's all in the Bible. Again, though, I'm not saying that is evil. I say that if you have an omni God and that God is good, all of that has to be good. So what Nome, the conclusions of Nome are two things. One, if that is the case, there's no such thing as morality. <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's completely pointless. What we think is good or bad means nothing because God ultimately knows. Hey, Dad. One more. And let me finish that. La the last point. Wait a second. The last point is... What's that? We'll run it out of time. I know I got one set. It's just one more sentence. And then the last thing is, is even if there was some delineation between good and bad, we're in no perspective to tell which one that is. So our only action is one of two things, complete and utter um, passivity. We see someone getting raped. Well, is that God's will? Apparently. Or we, <laughs> so we can't take an action. There, there's no way to do it because we don't know what we can't see through the mind of God. So it takes all agency out of us to be able to walk and and say anything to God or say anything about about that. Um, so, again, what Gnome demonstrates with a good omni God is there is no morality from an objective sense, definitely. And secondarily, even if there is, there's no way to tell what is good versus bad. So.
And and I, I hate to say it, Trey, but you demonstrated that in just about every one of your um, one of your um, examples. So I'm done from there. OK, um, well, I'll go ahead and let you close out, Ned. I do want to uh, apologize for interrupting you during your segment. Uh, no, not at all. I mean, that you, you guys were great to me. You never interrupted me. I shouldn't have done that. That was uh, that was sinful and wrong. I'm sorry, man. I, I, I should have waited my turn. Landed. Um, Landed again. I did. I mean, I I appreciate you guys putting so much work into it. I appreciate all the stuff that we did tonight. And, you know, I mean, for both sides, I think, you know, I was I was trying to get what was making me so bad is I've got pages upon pages of things that I wanted to quote. But I, I promised myself I'm going to come come at this from a conceptual standpoint, not a my quote versus your quote type deal. I just, I don't like those type of debates and I don't think most of the, the viewers do, or at least not my viewers. Um, so I wanted to get more into to the back and forth. So what I'm hoping is, is maybe after this, um, you know, I don't know, we get it and we decide what we're going to do with this as far as post it or whatever. Um, let's come back and just discuss this stuff as far as how we see all of this stuff going on. And I mean, everything's still on the table. I'm not saying we got to throw Luther out or we've got to stay with, you know, gnome or whatever, but the discussion part is what gets us somewhere. Throwing books back and forth at each other, to, at least in my opinion. I mean, I I understand that we need it for foundation, but I've got at least what? I mean, I don't want to go through. I got at least, but I know I've got at least seven different authors that I could that I could link right now. Again, I just we're just throwing books at each other. Let's try and yeah, take this stuff through. Yeah, and I think the only reason that, that that I did was, you know, some of the reasons we talked about. None of us are published. We, you know, this is history. So it's just going to decide our sources. And again, that's for the benefit of the audience. Hopefully they saw the books. They heard what, what we said. They can chase these things down for their benefits. Um, for us to kind of reflect on it, uh, I think it's built, you know, our worldview is going to shape how we understand those things and what, uh, what we may draw. One thing I do think that, that we could, you know, possibly talk about, and this is something for the audience to consider, is there are liabilities to both of our worldviews. You know, I'll just give one example that, that irks me personally. Um, well, I'll give two examples. One, there's, you know, if a KKK person takes a, a cross and sets it on fire at night and says the reason he does that is so that the light of Christ can shine in a dark world, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm not going to get rid of my symbols of the cross or a crucifix just because those people are taking that. You know, that, that's just the liability of having that as a symbol. Um, another liability is if we believe that God has spoken to people and communicated his plan of redemption um, in, in such a way that it went through a human element. Uh, even though I think Trey is certainly much more adequate than me, but we believe we can close that canon that God doesn't have anything else to say because his method of salvation and forgiveness of people was complete in Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. So God is done talking. I can't stop Pat Robertson or the International House of Prayer or New Apostolic Reformation, all these people saying God told them X, Y, and Z. That's a liability. Okay, and I just have to eat that and we have to try to fight it. Perhaps, you know, I don't know if you want to share a liability on um, – you know, possibly taking Darwinism as an explanatory model, but one of them could be the idea is somebody could take that and be racist with it. Somebody could say, you know, I'm the ball with it. Absolutely. I'm superior and, to you. So, and, and, yeah. and, and there have been plenty, but, and that's one of the things that we tried to hit on earlier is trying to marry Darwinism to evolution. It is like trying to marry ketchup to hot dogs. I mean, just because some people use it on hot dogs, I personally don't. I hate ketchup on hot dogs. There. You, they're independent um, beliefs. They're independent systems. And I think you mean atheism and evolution. You said Darwinism and evolution. Oh, okay. Sorry. I meant atheism. You're right. Um, but so the whole point there is, is that there, like you said, there are, there are just, maybe they're not just as many, but there's plenty of people out there who don't understand what, especially the newer, uh, more precise evolutionary theory says and what it what it prescribes as far as you know what should happen in its predictive model. 
um, they're going to go back to, like you said, an 1800s book and all of a sudden go, well, Darwin said that, you know, these people died and they're weak. So everybody that's weak should die. Yeah. Darwin didn't understand populations. He didn't understand evolution or um, genetics. He didn't understand how you can have someone who quote unquote is weak in one area, but can contribute unbelievable amounts, even though they're quote unquote weak physically or vice versa. They may be completely brain dead, but they're an incredible uh, physical specimen. And that's what group and population theory does when it, when you start, um, uh, attributing it or, or using it in, in a uh, scientific or more, I guess, evolutionary way. Um, so trying to marry atheism with that just, in my opinion, does not work at all because it's not the same thing. So. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And again, thank you, uh, Ned and Matthew, uh, for joining for this lively exchange. Uh, thank you, Trey, for your contribution. Uh, I'm sorry I took so long, buddy. You should have had a little bit more time um, to kind of unfold what you had prepared. But you did a good job of kind of bling, bringing in um, the, the second part of Ned's argument. And maybe this will spark other conversation. But uh, thank you guys for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you next time. All right. Good night, everybody. And I want to say thanks to everybody again. Matthew, great to see you again. Thanks, bud. Have fun.